Hey, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dan Painter. I am the Product Training and Development Manager here at Flint and Walling, and I will be hosting today's broadcast, which is actually a continuation of something we tried. A, I think it might have been a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I saw if you were on that broadcast, I apologize. I got 20 minutes into it, and I looked down, and my phone looks like it's dead in the water. I lost audio. It's obviously, you weren't able to hear me. And after four attempts of trying to reconnect, I still didn't have audio, so we obviously had to cancel this and, and reschedule it for today. So I appreciate you coming back for this. I found out uh, after the fact that this platform we use, this GoToMeeting platform, apparently the glitch was within that 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 system uh, because apparently everybody that was doing a meeting that time all across the country, all of them lost audio. So we weren't the lone rangers in that regard. Anyway, welcome back. Uh, today's topic is uh, everything about jet pumps, and I'm going to take this from the top. Um, from the top, uh, so maybe for some of you, the first 10-15 uh, minutes of this presentation may be a bit redundant. Um, but that said, over the next uh, 60 minutes, uh, we're going to talk about you know where are these jet pumps used, how are they, how do they work, and, and we're going to peel a few layers back on this particular category of product. Uh, just to learn and understand a little bit more about them. With jet pumps, you know, and I, I'll tell you what, jet pumps hold a little special place in my heart because I'm going to tell you something, 40 years ago, that's how we got groundwater into homes. Um, maybe 50 years ago, I don't know, but there was a time when jet pumps were, that, you know, that was the only only way you really had of bringing water out of a well and bringing it into a house. Uh, so these jet pumps were very, very popular in the day. Today, however, they're not quite as popular. In fact, uh, I'll share a few opinions with you in this presentation, and as I do, I will be up front and let you know it is an opinion. But in my opinion today, uh, I would say 90% of all jet pumps purchased are purchased as replacements. Uh, I think it's rare today to have a home in the country and a brand new well drilled and not have a submersible pump in that well. I think that, by and large, uh, speaks for itself. And, and of course, submersible pumps are extremely popular today. But these jet pumps, they're going to hang around for a long time because, again, the replacement market is pretty, pretty uh, substantial. And so that said, uh, most of these pumps are, are going in as replacements. When we look at what typical jet pumps are used for, right? I mean, it's not a difficult uh, question to answer. A typical jet pump is going to be a pump that's going to bring water into a home, uh, a small to medium-sized home, uh, typically. And, and, and within a small to medium-sized home, you're going to have uh, you're going to have appliances in there, you know, a kitchen sink, a toilet, bathtub, etc. Uh, but again, this was this was a perfect fit for a jet pump because the demand for water is not terribly great. Uh, I don't imagine that a jet pump would suffice well in a let's say a seven bedroom home that has, you know, three and a half baths. I mean, that's a, the demand for water in there would be much greater. So typical jet pumps are used to provide water for small to medium sized houses. They're also used to provide water for irrigation for the same. Again, we're, we're not, you're not going to irrigate a football field with a jet pump, but you can certainly irrigate these people's front yard. And so residential irrigation is not a, uh, an application that is a stretch for a jet pump, a jet pump, particularly a shallow well jet pump, uh, used quite frequently for that, as a matter of fact. They're also used around uh, lakes uh, for the same reason, small lakes, small cottages. Uh, we have a bunch of them here in northern Indiana. And you get up there around these lake homes and these lake cottages, and, and most all of them just have a, a jet pump pulling water in for a, uh, a water supply for those homes. When we look at where a water comes from, for a jet pump at least, that's pretty easy to answer. I mean, I've, with, with uh, you know other pumps that we manufacture here, the water source can be pretty broad, ranging from municipal water to uh, lakes and streams and everything else. But with a jet pump, the overwhelming majority, not all, but the overwhelming majority of the applications more than likely uh, will incorporate the, uh, the, uh, a well. So most jet pumps are going to be installed on a well. If they're not installed on a well, then you might find a jet pump 
that could be installed on, say, an underground or buried cistern. These aren't very large tanks. Uh, it's not very far down to the water. And it is also something that a lot of jet pumps are put on. Uh, they, they, may, they may hook a jet pump up to a, a cistern like this, and that jet pump would only uh, provide water for irrigation. Uh, whereas when it's hooked up to a well, you can probably do both. You can bring water into the house for your water use in the house, and also you can provide water from that well uh, for irrigation. But in this case here with uh, an underground cistern, that's almost always going to be irrigation. That's not a quality of water uh, that you're going to want to consume, actually, because if you look at the difference between these two water sources, I've got my dashboard in the way. It's always in the way. Let me get it over to the other side there. Okay, select for the cisterns. That's typically, as you see here, rainwater runoff, a surface water runoff. Uh, that's not a water quality that you're going to want to uh, cook or, or consume uh, because it, it, you know, it's probably got bacteria in it and everything else. So it's not a bad thing to use for irrigation, though. Um, whereas the well, it utilizes uh, ground, a groundwater supply, and then that groundwater supply is, is such that it's going to be potable and uh, can be used for consumption. So again, these are the two types of water sources primarily that a jet pump could be used for. It's not a stretch. Uh, to imagine a jet pump, that a sh particularly a shallow well jet pump, and I'm going to go through those uh, types with you here in a second, but it's not a stretch for a shallow well jet pump to actually pull water out of a, a lake, uh, because again, uh, if a jet pump's sitting on a deck or a dock, it doesn't have to lift that water very far, no more than it has to lift water up out of this cistern, and so these are all applications uh, for jet pumps. So moving on, uh, here's a couple of jet pumps. They don't have to be our brand. It doesn't matter. I don't have them up here for any other reason than to show you. But here's a jet pump hooked up to a well. Uh, so this is the suction line here. It goes in, uh, from the comes out of the well into the pump and from the pump to the tank and then onto the house. Here's another one, uh, a single pipe running down to the water source. That's uh, that's probably that's probably in the southern part of the United States because uh, up here where I live. You don't install pumps outdoors, they're, 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 they're going to freeze. So I imagine both these shots are probably from the southern part of the country. Nonetheless, let's just uh, let me get this dashboard over the other side again. Um, when we look at uh, when we look at wells, uh, there was a time, and still to this day, and I just want to touch on this briefly. I'm not going to hang I'm not going to hang on this topic very long, uh, but. Uh, in the early days, they, they used what was called a drive point, and that drive point looked like this uh, image I brought up on the screen on the left-hand side. It had a very robust cast iron uh, taper uh, point to it, like an arrow. This thing would probably be three or four feet long top to bottom, uh, maybe about an inch and a quarter or so in diameter. And there would be a stainless steel mesh screen wrapped around this. Uh, and these, these type of drive points or well points were used in geographic areas where the water table was relatively shallow and the material that you had to go through to get to it was more loamy or sandy type soil. Because again, you're hammering this thing down, kind of banging it down in there until you get to that water supply. Now, the reason I bring that up is because still to this day, we see these things around these lake cottages uh, oftentimes, and uh, there was a jet pump built to, to uh, go right on this drive point. I don't think I've got an image of that. It was called, well, yes, I do. Uh, it's called a vertical jet pump. But let me, let me show you here. So, so you, you've got this drive point. Uh, now, that, that, that drive point's only three or four feet long, so it probably stops about right in here. You're going to have to put a stick of galvanized or some type of pipe on, couple onto it to, to get it down to this depth. Um, but once it hits the water, water comes through the screen and it will seek a level within that, uh, within that uh, drop pipe there. Like I said, this is only about an inch and a quarter in diameter. So unlike a typical well today that you can range anywhere from four, five, six, seven, eight, eight ten inches or, or larger, these things weren't very big around. They were about an inch and a quarter. And, and we made a jet pump and still do today, still do to this day. It's what's called a vertical jet pump. Not a lot of them sold, quite frankly. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this particular style of jet pump. But that's what it was designed for, 
primarily as those drive points. And so um, there are parts of the country where, believe it or not, these are very, very popular. Florida happens to be one of them. They do a lot of irrigation in Florida, as you can imagine. Uh, it's got a fairly shallow water table down there, probably not a, a stretch to imagine that either. And the soil is relatively sandy. So, I mean, there's contractors down there that probably go out and put four or five of these drive points in in a single day uh, because they can get down through the sand material quite, quite quickly and get into a shallow water supply. And again, this is all used for irrigation, and they'll put a vertical jet pump on that. But when we talk about these jet pumps, and this is the, probably one of the most important things I could ever uh, emphasize when it comes to jet pumps. If somebody calls me up and they want to talk to me about a jet pump or they want to apply a jet pump, I've got the very first question I'm going to ask is how far is it to that water? What do you mean? Well, from where the pump's going to be located, how far down is it where, to where the water uh, source is at? So for a jet pump, in this case, for this vertical jet, you had to be less than 25 feet because it could never pull water up from a distance further than that. So one application for this jet pump is that the water source could not be further than 25 feet away. And uh, if you drill a well, you know, if you drill a well, this is going to move off that drive point. We, we're going to drill a well out here. Well, this uh, well is going to have a casing. It's either going to be steel or plastic and more than likely have a screen on the bottom, similar to this drive uh, point over here, but you're gonna get an influx of water into that well. And again, when we, when we look at from where the pump's located down to where that water level's at, we wanna know how far that is. If it's less than 25 feet or 25 feet or less, uh, the industry would call that a shallow well. That's not a, 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 a term that I've fabricated or F&W fabricated, that's an industry standard uh, if a water source is within 25 feet of where the pump's located, that's going to be considered a shallow well. On the other hand, if you have a well and the water's further away than that, all right, it's more than 25 feet away, then in this case, those are referred to as deep wells. And so this is an important lesson when it comes to jet pumps, is knowing how far away that water is from where that pump's going to be located. And I'm talking about vertical distances, okay? I don't care about horizontal distance. Only the vertical distance from where the pump's located down to that water source, how far is it? How many feet away is it? Is it a shallow well or is it a deep well? That's really what we're trying to determine. And it's based on what I've got on the screen, less than 25 feet or more than 25 feet. Um, you, you say, well, you know, why, why is this so important to know? Because there's two types of jet pumps. There is a shallow well jet pump, obviously made for uh, applications where the water source is less than 25 feet away. And its counterpart is a deep well jet pump for water sources that are further away than 25 feet. So that's why it's important to always know how far it is down to the water source. Now that cistern that I showed you in the earlier slide, obviously that's not going to be more than 25 feet away. If a pump's setting over the edge of a deck or a dock down to a lake, probably not a 25 foot drop there, you know, it might be two or three feet, who knows. But uh, at any rate, that's the definition between a shallow well jet pump and a deep well jet pump is the, uh, the, the, uh, the depth that they're able to lift water. <clears throat> you know, why do they call a jet pump a jet pump? And if you were on my last class, I think I did get this far uh, before we got cut off. And hopefully today I don't look down at the phone and see the same thing happen. But, you know, a lot of times uh, during normal years, you know, unlike what we've all experienced the last year, we bring a lot of our customers up to our factory over the fall, winter months for tours and training. And it's not it's not a, uncommon if I get a group up here that, that uh, you know, are kind of on these jet pumps. They, a lot of well drillers, they, they, they just want to sell submersibles. I get that. Okay, I get that. But there are those out there that are in jet pump markets. And, they, and I asked them, I said, listen, why do you think they call a jet pump a jet pump? And I had an old boy raise his hand one day, and I said, yes, sir, what, what's, your, what's your definition? 
And he looked at me and he said, well, let me ask you something, Mr. Painter. You ever hear one run? And I chuckled a little bit when he asked me that because I couldn't understand where he was going. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I've, I've heard jet pumps. Yes, a lot of times I've heard a lot of them run. Why? He said, well, they sound like a damn jet. <laughs> That's exactly what he said in that classroom. And I had to look at him. I said, sir, I don't think you're talking about this brand because uh, our pumps don't make a whole lot of noise. So, But anyway, you know, everybody's got their own opinion, right? So I'll share another opinion with you as to why I think they may call a jet pump a jet pump. First of all, it's a fairly simple pump to begin with. Uh, you know, it's a pump that's uh, powered by an electric motor, which uh, we manufacture here. And in fact, I, I'll, I'll throw this in because uh, I'll probably not remember if I go beyond where I'm at now. But just a sidebar, uh, Flint & Walling is the only pump company, the only one in North America, not the United States, in North America that manufactures their own jet and centrifugal motors and we've been doing that since the 50s so when you come to our factory for a tour you're not just going to experience the pumps manufactured you're going to see the motors also manufactured from scratch so anyway it's a it's a electric motor that runs a a single impeller on our motor shaft so basically you got one impeller in each one of these pumps all right but in order for a jet pump to function whether it's a shallow well or a deep well. It must be accompanied by, by what? Believe it or not, by a jet. <laughs> uh, there's two jets up there on your screen. There's a shallow well jet and there's a deep well jet. And these, again, are not my terms. This is more of an industry uh, standard type of term. Uh, some people referred to these jets as ejectors back in the days, and, and that's okay. That's, a, that's, a, you know, I, that's, just, that's, that's okay too. Uh, but that's what these are. These are jets. And so in order for a jet pump to function, this pump must have either a shallow well jet or a deep well jet in order for it to pump water. So perhaps the fact that these require a jet may be a good reason why they call them jet pumps. How do these jet pumps work? Well, I think everybody has experienced this in the past, right? Everybody's taken a garden hose and, and watched the water roll out the end of it whether you're washing the car, watering the grass, whatever you might be doing. Back in the day, that's where we used to uh, satisfy our thirst, <laughs> out the end of a garden hose. But everybody's experienced this. I think everybody's experienced this as well. Sometimes when I'm sitting in a classroom, I'll, I'll uh, uh, pretend that there's a hose bib in the wall behind me, and I'll say to the folks, I'll say, listen, well, let's just pretend there's this hose bib behind me. I'm going to hook up a four-foot piece of garden hose onto that hose bib. Uh, kind of like what they put on your washing machine, your clothes washer. You know, it's only about three or four feet long, and that's all I'm going to put on there. And I'm going to open that hose bib up full blast. And I'm going to stand up in the front of this classroom, and I'm going to see how many of you I can get wet. Well, I'm pretty sure everybody in the first row is going to get soaked because this, the water's coming out the end of this hose fast enough and enough pressure. Uh, you're probably going to get good and wet. And if you guys in that second row, uh, maybe waist down, uh, certainly get your feet. But all you guys back there in that fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth row, uh, I'm, I can't get the water back there to you. Why? There's not enough pressure. There's not enough pressure to send that water all the way back to the back of the classroom. But I can change that by doing what they're doing on that right-hand side. And that's something we've all done before. You put your thumb over the end of that garden hose, you restrict that opening, right? That's what's happening, is you're restricting that opening. But why is that water now able to go all the way back to row number eight, nine, or 10? Well, because by restricting that opening, I've really increased the velocity of that water coming out of that, out of that hose now. And that increased velocity is key because that's what's taking that water and shooting it now all the way across the classroom or all the way across the backyard, either one. But I want to focus on this increased velocity because it's going to be key in how a jet pump functions. Here's another example. I've got a confession to make. I have a lot of children, more than you would ever guess probably, but all these kids had science fair projects. And one day I was helping one of my children with a science fair project, and we were going to demonstrate this thing we just talked about, this velocity. So we took a piece of three-quarter inch copper pipe. I kind of 
put that up there as a mimic uh, look of a three-quarter inch. Imagine that being a three-quarter inch copper pipe, probably know, 12, 14 inches long. I drilled a hole in the top of it. The reason I drilled a hole in the top of it is because I inserted a smaller copper tube into that hole and soldered around it. So it was sealed up there. But, you know, you could, this was free path. It was like a Y, you know, you could go through here, you could go up through here. I pressed a nozzle in there. The reason I pressed that nozzle in there is kind of like that old boy holding his thumb over the end of that guard hose, okay? He restricted that opening. And when we restricted that opening, what happened? We created velocity. So I put a hose bib on or a hose uh, fitting on the end of that copper tube and I brought a hose and hooked it up. So we're out in the backyard. I've got this whole thing hooked up. So we open up the hose bib. It's, of course, when we do that, now I'm getting water coming into my copper tube until it gets to that nozzle. And again, once it gets to that nozzle, it's very much like having your thumb over the end of a garden hose. What do you mean? <laughs> what I mean is I was shooting that water out there 40 feet. I mean, this is, it was really sh shooting out of that nozzle. And so that's where the increased velocity come from. And again, I, I can't remember if it was a, probably one of my boys, I would imagine. But I said, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your finger over the end of that tube, that little tube up there. Yeah, do you feel anything? And they about freaked out. They go, oh my God, what, what's up with this? It's kind of like a, it's trying to suck my finger down into that tube. And that's exactly right. And here's the, here's why a jet pump works is because it's going to take the velocity that it creates. Or it's going to take velocity and it's going to create suction. All right. So this velocity here has a pulling effect. And so this is actually pulling air in behind it. So really the water that you take your finger off this, uh, off this tube, this water turns milky. Why? Because I'm adding all this air to it. It's pulling all that air down to it. So it has a hazy look to it more than anything else. Put your finger back on. It's, it's hold, it wants to hold it right there. And so that velocity creates suction. Another analogy, and this is a little dated and I'm hesitant to even use it anymore. But, you know, if somebody's smoking a cigarette inside of a car, I imagine after two or three puffs, if all the windows are rolled up, that car compartment's going to be filled up with smoke, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it seems logical that, you know, if you don't have any windows rolled down, you're going to fill the whole compartment up with smoke. And let's suppose you're running down a highway at 60, 70 miles an hour. Well, what happens to that smoke when you roll the window? Never mind, you don't have to roll the window down. Just crack it an inch or two. What happens to the smoke? Well, you can see it being pulled out of the car, out of the, the, the compartment of the car. Well, why is that happening? Well, once again, past that small opening in the window is a tremendous amount of velocity moving by called air. There's a lot of air moving past that window opening. And that, I'm telling you, that velocity creates that pulling effect. And that's what's pulling that smoke out. So let's look at these pumps now. And let's, let's figure out how we can tie what we just talked about for the last five minutes into a jet pump. So um, here's what we're going to do. Now, this pump here. If you take that shallow well jet that we just showed you in the previous screen uh, slide, uh, that will actually bolt right up to the front of this pump here. So, so there's two openings in the front of the pump. I'm hovering my uh, highlighter over those two openings there. So with this gasket and two bolts, this will bolt right up to the front of the pump, okay? So when you do that, what you basic, basically have done now is you've taken this 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 jet pump over here and you can made it a shallow well jet pump because it has a shallow well jet attached to it. All right, so here's what I don't think a lot of people uh, understand about jet pumps. Um, again, now if you look at these two openings in the front of that pump with this image here, if you look at those two openings, they're actually, both these openings are actually threaded. They have female pipe threads. When we're using this pump for a shallow well application, we're not using any of those threads at all. This, this jet's going to bolt right up to this flange and voila, away we go. But what I don't think a lot of people understand is that a portion, a portion of the water that that pump is pumping is, is going to come out the bottom opening of that flange right there. So most of the water coming in from your water source is going to go out the discharge. But a portion of it is going to be pumped right back through this bottom opening and right into this shallow well jet. 
Well, it gets to this point here and it's gonna make a U-turn. So this casting is such that this water comes in, it makes a U-turn and it goes through that nozzle. And the same thing is created here that's created by putting your thumb over the garden hose. It's the same thing I created with that little piece of copper tubing out in the backyard is behind this velocity is that pulling effect, that suction effect. So what in, ultimately ends up happening is that water going through that nozzle creates that suction, brings the water from the water source, and most of it's gonna go out the discharge, but it will continually run water uh, through this jet to drive that nozzle to create that velocity, to create that suction. So that's basically how a jet pump works. I mean, that's how we're able to suck water out of a well, out of a cistern, out of a lake. If you look at this little plug that I've got my uh, cursor next to right now, this is what's called a, a clean-out plug, okay, a clean-out plug. So imagine that this jet assembly is, is bolted up to the front of this pump. I would tell contractors that if you find ever that a jet pump is, is pumping very little or no water at all, there's a good chance, think about this, there's a good chance that if this nozzle gets plugged or partially plugged, you probably aren't gonna create the velocity that you need, right? You're not, if it's plugged, you're not gonna create the velocity. And if you don't create the velocity, you don't create suction. If the pump's not bringing water in, it's not gonna deliver water. So it's gonna pump very, very little, if any at all, out to discharge. So that clean out plug is placed there for the purpose of removing it and taking a piece of copper wire uh, being able to go in and perhaps dislodge anything that might have been lodged in that nozzle without having to disrupt this whole plumbing and without having to take that jet completely off the pump itself. And so that's called a clean out plug right there. And the only reason it's there is to be able to access that nozzle should anything uh, foreign get in there and get lodged. So again, uh, on a shallow well application, here's our shallow well pump up here. I've got the jet bolted to the front of it. Another thing that's a very distinct characteristic of a shallow well jet pump is the fact that there is only one line running down to the water source, only one line. Of course, at the bottom of that line will be a foot, I'm sorry, I'm a little ahead of myself. Anytime you're pulling water out of the top of a well, and a lot of times with an above ground pump, i.e. jet pumps or centrifugal pumps or lawn sprinkling pumps, or whatever, most submersible pumps are gonna exit the side of a well through a pitless adapter, but all above ground pumps are gonna come out the top of the well. And if you're coming out the top of a well, uh, supplying a suction line on a, an above ground pump, you need to have a sanitary seal up there, and that's what this thing's called. It's called a sanitary seal. So in the case of this shallow well jet pump, I've only got the one pipe running down to my water source, so I only really need one of these two openings. So I'm gonna use one and plug the other. That's what I'm gonna do on a shallow well application. And then I'm gonna set this sanitary seal down inside the casing and I'm gonna tighten these four bolts down. And as I do, uh, it sandwiches this, uh, these two uh, pieces of cast iron and it causes this rubber gasket to wedge out. And so it'll form a tight sanitary watertight seal on the inside walls of that casing. And that's very, very important because the last thing we ever, ever want to have happen is for any surface water that could possibly encroach into our well because we got an open top. Um, uh, we don't want to get surface water into our water well water supply. I'm going to tell you, surface water is going to have bacteria and not maybe. Now, that's not to say that all bacteria is harmful, but I'm telling you, there will be bacteria in surface water. And the other thing that we don't want to do is we certainly don't want to contaminate a well to the extent it could contaminate an aquifer, an underground water reservoir, because if that gets contaminated, um, it's going to be decades uh, before that can get cleaned up again. And so that's a sanitary seal that goes on the top of all uh, wells that uh, jet pumps used on. There's also going to be a foot valve uh, located at the end of that suction pipe. Uh, that foot valve op operates much like a check valve. If you know how a check valve works, you know that water can only pass through it in one direction. And the same with a foot valve. Uh, water can only pass through in one direction. But because a foot valve is used at the end of a suction line and usually submerged in water, uh, a foot valve is going to have a mesh screen. 
Uh, you'll find these that can be meshed out of stainless like you see here. I've seen others that are more kind of like a plastic uh, screen. But nonetheless, uh, the screen's there just to keep any large particulate and foreign uh, material from getting into your suction line that ultimately could get into the pump. But that's the foot valve down there. I had a guy call me out one day in, in a class and he said, now, I'm not sure what you just said is right. And I said, well, remind me what it was I just said. He said, well, he said, you talking about this water level, okay? He said, if I understood what you told me, what you're saying is that from where the pump's located down to the water source, you only measured down to here. And you said, that's gotta be 25 feet or less in order for that pump to work. I said, yes, sir, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I said. He said, but sir, that's not where the water's coming in. The water's coming in way down here. And so if the water's coming in through this foot valve and it's gotta go all the way up this suction pipe before it can get into the pump, why wouldn't you measure this entire distance here? Well, I use the analogy that you now see on the right-hand side of your screen, and I said, sir, let me just ask you a question. If I had a big old tall glass of water sitting here on the table, and I fill that water all the way up to the, I fill that water all the way up the top of the glass, and I shove that straw in there, where's the water level inside the straw? They said, well, that's easy. It's at the same level as it is in the glass. And I said, you're right. And when you put your lips on the top of that straw, you got to understand the water's already that far up. So when you lift it, <laughs> you're only lifting at this distance here, right? Same thing over here. The moment you drop that drop pipe down into that water, think of it as a straw inside the glass because water's going to come through this foot valve and wherever that water level is in the wells, probably where the water level inside your suction pipe is going to be just like this straw over here. So therefore, it's already this far up in that pipe. You're only having to lift at that distance. So I'm going to hold firm on the fact that when we measure these to determine whether they're a shallow well or not, we're going to go from an imaginary line that would represent the inlet of that pump. I don't give crap about the horizontal distance, but that imaginary line down to the water source right there. And that needs to be less than 25 feet. So this de device that I put on this shallow well jet, this, 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 this jet that I put on this shallow well pump is the, is the uh, component that creates that suction, right? It's the component that creates that suction. And that can't pull water from a depth further than 25 feet. It, just, it can't happen. Well, what happens if you are more than that? Well, in that case, then we're going to opt to go with a deep well jet. And the, really, the only difference between a deep well jet and a shallow well jet has nothing to do with the pump itself, but rather that jet or that ejector. I pulled that slide up that showed there was a shallow well jet and meant there was a deep well jet. I also uh, showed you the front of the, uh, the pump it has two openings, and they're both threaded. So in the case of a deep well application, uh, we're going to thread pipes into those two openings, and we're going to run two pipes down to the water source, and we're going to put a deep well jet down closer to where that water source is at. Sometimes it's actually in the water. But if we're going to create suction, and we want to get that water from a level that's way down here, you're not going to do that if you try to create your suction up here. So you've got to create it down here closer to that water level. And so that's why we would have a deep well jet. So when we look at shallow well and deep well jets, the way I would differentiate one from the other, we've talked about this, one's 25 feet or less, the other one is more than 25 feet, you can probably get away up to 90 or 100 feet with a deep well jet. You get water that's below, further away than that, you need to start thinking submersible pumps. But at any rate, um, that sanitary seal, that's why it's got those two openings in the top. In the case of the shallow well, I use one plug the other. In the case of the deep well, I'm going to use them both. And when I showed you this shallow well jet up here, I was indicating there's water comes out that bo bottom opening, makes a U-turn up here, and back into the pump. Same thing happens here, but since the jet's not right up to the pump, all that water's coming down this second tube all the way down to this jet, making the U-turn here, and that's where that suction's created. And it comes up that second pipe. All right, so this is a deep well. Uh, I showed you the shallow well jet earlier. This is a, a deep well jet's gonna be mounted vertically. Obviously, it's gotta go into sometimes as small as a four inch well casing. 
Uh, so it's going to be mounted vertically. Uh, there's going to be two places on here to connect those two pipes coming down to it. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the one pipe is going to carry what's called drive water. That's that water that drives that nozzle. So whether it's a shallow well or a deep well, the water coming out that bottom port of that pump is technically referred to as, as drive water. It's, it's, it's what's going to drive these nozzles. It's going to do the same thing in a deep well jet that it does in a shallow well. It's going to make a U-turn down there on the other side of that nozzle and then come right back up through that nozzle and create that velocity. So now we're creating that suction and that pulling effect down closer to where that water's at. And that's why we're able to, to operate a, a deep well jet pump when the water table is further away than 25 feet. So again, uh, when we look at the difference between deep wells and shallow wells, first of all, there's a, there's a pretty good uh, visual. You know, if somebody says, I don't know if I've got a deep well or a shallow well pump, how do I know? Well, let me ask you a question. How many pipes are running to the water source? That'll answer that question. If there's just one pipe running there, then you've got a shallow well pump. If there's two, then obviously you've got a deep well pump. So the difference there would be a single pipe versus two pipe. So that's primarily the difference between the two as far as the uh, deep well and shallow well go. And here's a couple of more images, I guess. So over here, these were all shallow well pumps. Now, obviously one pipe running from the water source. Here's actually an F&W. Uh, it's got a shallow well ejector uh, mounted to the front of it, um, but there's just one pipe running out here to the, running to the water source, just one pipe coming out of that pump to the water source. Those are shallow well. Here's a couple of uh, deep well applications. So now you can see the difference, right? You got two pipes that's gonna run down into that well because they've got a deep well ejector further down in that well somewhere. And the same to the one just to the right of that. Uh, there, you can see there are two pipes coming off the front of that pump. One here and one just above it. So the, the, those are two pipe deep well application, single pipe shallow well application. Okay. Now, if we look at these pumps here, there's a, we call them jet pumps, yes. And depending on which jet they have, we'll attach either a shallow well or deep well name to that. But the, technically, if you look at these two pumps I have on the screen, these are often referred to as uh, convertible, convertible pumps. Um, some people at least refer them that way. And, and why would you say they're convertible? Well, because I can take either one of these pumps, either one of them, and if I add a shallow well jet to it, it becomes a shallow well pump. And if I add a deep well jet to it, it can become a deep well pump. And so therefore, I can take one pump and have two ejectors or two jets. And I, the reason this is called convertible is I can take this pump and I can make it a shallow well or a deep well. It just depends on which uh, jet I'm going to accompany that pump with. A lot of our supply houses, they like this notion because uh, they can stock just one pump. I could stock this one pump, either one of these pumps, and both of these. And it's like stocking a deep well pump and a shallow well pump, but I only have one pump. And so it minimizes some inventory over here and allows you to have that flexibility over here to take this pump in either direction you want. That's called a convertible, all right, convertible. Now, there are also jet pumps that are made and they're only for shallow well. And we sell a ton of these things because a lot of our jet pump customers are in shallow well, applica well applications. Um, and so they don't need a convertible pump because the likelihood of them having to use it in a deep well is pretty doggone rare. So they say, well, what, you know, why should I spend the extra money? I, I'll get one of these shallow well pumps. It's only for shallow well, but I want to point out why. If you look at the front of every one of these pump castings, okay, every one of them, you only see one pipe coming out of there right? One pipe, that's shallow well only, one pipe. This is the jet. This is the jet. Right there's your clean out plug. Here's where it makes the U-turn, right there. But that jet is a integral part of that casting. It can't be removed. You can't take it off on and off like you did the previous uh, pump that I had up here. So these pumps will always be uh, at, uh, for straight up uh, shallow well applications. 
Um, and again, they're popular in, in, in a lot of markets because the shallow well represents either 90 or 100 percent of all their jet pump sales. So if it's that high on shallow well, more than likely they'll buy the straight up shallow well pumps. I'm going to spend just a minute or two on this. I guess I wasn't expecting this slide to come up, but this is a this is another jet pump. You can see uh, it would be convertible because I could bolt a shallow well ejector to it or a jet, or I could run two pipes out of it. Uh, but this has a power conversion unit that goes on the back. And I'll tell you, there are a couple of applications for this pump. Here where I live in northern Indiana, we have a very, very large Amish population. And a lot of those Amish homes, are supply, they, 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 they supply water with this jet pump. They'll put a pulley on this thing and, and run it with a gas generator. Um, and so instead of having an electrical motor back here, you're going to have a pulley with a, with a like a, a, a belt uh, that, that this whole thing gets ran by a generator. So one application for these, these pumps uh, would be obviously areas that have uh, little or no electricity. And there's all parts of um, particularly out west, I think of West Texas, I've done a lot of traveling out there, you can come across some ranches that have these watering ponds, but they don't have any electricity out there. A lot of them have windmills. Uh, but this is another application where a pump can be used uh, uh, without the use of electricity. It would be run by a generator. Uh, but I'll just throw that up there real quick. I want to talk about priming a jet pump. It's, this is important. Priming a pump is very important. All above ground pumps, jet pumps, all of them, they all need to be primed. Uh, so if we look at this jet pump here, we know that the uh, the suction line is is uh, the suction line is in the front, right up front, and it discharges right here. Some pumps, and most of our jet pumps, most of our jet pumps will have a dedicated priming port. That's a dedicated priming port. So we put a pipe plug in there, um, but the purpose of that priming port is that you uh, can can pull that plug out and put a funnel in. Now you can uh, start to prime that pump by adding water right through the priming port here. This pipe could all this discharge could already be plumbed in, right? It probably will be, uh, so it's already hard plumbed in. But this gives you a place to get water into this pump body uh, without having to. This will remove this discharge over here. I also want to point out this plug on top of that jet right here. Take that out when you're priming because you'll find that your priming will, will occur much quicker because it's a way of venting any air or allowing any air pockets that have accumulated in that suction line. It, it gives it a pretty quick uh, place to get uh, expelled out of that suction line. If a pump by chance doesn't have a priming port, and like I said, most of our jet pumps do. But if it doesn't, the recommendation would be uh, to come out the discharge of the pump and incorporate a T. Uh, of course, then this line here uh, coming off the side of that T runs to service wherever you're using that water. Put a plug in the top of that T. So now you've got a place of priming that pump with or without a priming port. So if this pump should have ever lost its prime uh, at some point down the road, and you incorporated this T, all you need to do is take that plug out and you can start repriming the pump uh, on the top side of that T. Of course, if you opted not to put that T in there, then you're going to have to figure out another way to get the water into the pump. Uh, but that makes it pretty convenient if you ever have to come back and reprime is to incorporate a T on that discharge. When we prime a pump, it's, uh, it's, a, it's all about getting the air pockets and the bubbles uh, out of it. And so when priming a pump, please, please take a little measure of patience, of patience. Our number one cause for initial pump failure on above ground pumps is the fact they were not primed or not primed properly. So we want to eliminate all that air, um, both from the pump and the pipe. So when you're priming the pump, you don't want to just fill the pump body up, but that suction pipe, wherever it goes, uh, you want to you want to make sure you get that all filled with water. And of course, there's that little air plug I asked. If you want to take that out, that helps vent any air that might be in this suction pipe. That's going to speed up your priming process uh, by, by removing that little plug on the top side of that. So when we look at uh, 
that's that's the priming. And and again, just make sure we get all the air bubbles out. If you don't get all the air bubbles out, or you get all the air out, and th and you fire this pump up, and here comes a slug of air. The moment that impeller is no longer submerged in water, it quits. It doesn't move anything anymore, and so it just sits there and spins and does nothing. Uh, pump's running. You're not getting any water. It's because the pump needs to be reprimed and reprimed properly to get everything here submerged in water. Uh, this is a fairly easy guide to pump selection, and I, the reason I bring it up here is because when we talk about jet pumps, unlike you know, the submersible pumps, and you're all aware of what those pumps are capable of doing. Uh, the application for jet pumps are, you know, they really are somewhat limited. So, for example, if, if your depth to the water source or the water level, we've talked about this, is less than 25 feet, well, then you can either go with a straight up shallow well jet pump, like we showed you just a minute or two ago, or you can take a convertible jet pump, put a shallow well jet on the front of it. Right, so either one of those would suffice if you're only looking at something less than 25 feet. Uh, you go 25 feet to say 90 feet. Now we got some decisions to make as to what type of pump we're going to use because a shallow well jet pump no longer is applicable. Once you exceed that 25 feet, it's no longer applicable. Uh, and at 25 feet, I'm going to tell you something. That 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 even there is pushing it, in my opinion. Uh, you can achieve that if you're at sea level, but most of us aren't. So I kind of look more towards that 20 feet. I, I get to 20 feet. I start, you know, I start uh, uh, looking at the end of the application for a shallow well. That's just an opinion, by the way. But if you're at 25 to 90 feet, you got a couple of choices. You, in this case, if you're going to use a jet pump, you're going to have to use a deep well. And when you use a deep well jet pump, it is going to be a convertible. Uh, because you're going to need to take the two pipes off the front of that pump, run it down to that deep well jet. Uh, your other choice, obviously, then starts to go submersible. And, uh, and if you get beyond that, uh, that's where submersible pumps are. You know, if you're 90 to a, a little over a couple hundred feet, you're going to use a submersible pump if you want to get that water out of there. You know, you start to get you know, the length of a football field or more. I mean, then we're going to go with what we call our deep set submersibles. So, some of these deep sets can go down eight, 900 feet uh, pretty easily. But this is just kind of a, a guide uh, based on one criteria, and that's how far is it to water. But that's a pretty important part criteria when we're talking about jet pumps because they are limited as to how far they can lift water up and out of a well. So anyway, sizing a jet pump. Well, okay, I got one more graphic coming up. Sorry. And again, okay. And again, I'm, I'm talking about vertical distances only. Um, that's what we're referring to as, uh, as, as lift. It's just the vertical distance, the horizontal. Uh, if a jet pump sits you know, 40 feet away from the well, I don't care about that 40 feet. Uh, it's, it's down to that water level that I do care about. So um, it's just the vertical distance only. Uh, jet pumps are pretty easy to size. and, and uh, the way I, boy, you know, there's there's a very there's various methods out there uh, when it comes to sizing pumps. This is one that I've kind of used for, and I think the industry for the most part also uses this. But uh, you know, how much water is this this house going to need? Is I'm going to put this jet pump on, and and the best way I would would tell you for a jet pump is to use what's called a fixture count method. And if you've never aren't familiar with this by chance, um, the gallons per minute rating of the pump, when we're talking about how much water it needs, the gallons per minute rating of the pump should equal the total number of fixtures in the house. For example, um, these fixtures will include faucets, toilets, uh, tub shower combinations, outside hose bibs, water using appliances, dishwashers, clothes washers, laundry tub sinks, whatever that may be. So if you imagine we have a house with one full bath, all right, that would be, we know that a full bath is going to have a lavatory, uh, a sink, it's going to have a tub shower combo probably, and it'll have a toilet. So there's three, there's three fixtures. What else you got in this house? Well, I got a kitchen sink, okay, uh, anything else? I got an outside hose bib, I got a washing machine, but as you can see, if you add up those fixtures, and this daggone dashboard, 
Ah, what do I do? What do I do? That thing's not moving. All right, well, as you can see up here in the top right, I've got dashboards all over my screen now. Um, eight, eight is the total number of fixtures. So eight gallon per minute is what you're going to need. That's a pretty easy way of determining the amount of water that you're going to need when uh, sizing a jet pump. Um, you know, if you've got two outside hose bibs, then it's going to be nine gallon a minute. If you've got, uh, you know, anything else, then it just keeps adding up. The likelihood of all these fixtures ever being on at one time, probably 0%, right? Probably 0% that every one of them is going to run. But based on that fixture count, you know, uh, the, the flow rate that this pump's going to provide is going to be plenty adequate. If you're in a, if you're taking a shower, what if they got all these water saving devices and these fixtures anymore? Well, I don't imagine the water coming out of a shower head's coming out at more than three gallon a minute. Kitchen sink's probably about one and a half. So you could be running several appliances at one time and never exceed that eight gallon per minute. Um, so this is not a bad way for uh, uh, sizing up a jet pump. Anyway, um, I am looking down, and I'm 54 minutes into this, and I believe uh, I'm really near the end of it. I'm going to be adding some more web conferences to this. Uh, Y'all were on the, uh, our, our website to uh, register for this. I'm going to be adding some more um, topics. Uh, I, I think I've got uh, web conferences scheduled through the end of this month. I think April 1st is the last schedule. And I'm going to throw another dozen or more up there again. And we're going to carry this on out as long as we need to. And as long as I'm looking at my dashboard and I see people that are sitting in and listening on this, I'm going to keep on going. And one of the topics I think I might want to consider is, you know, how do you how do you recondition a jet pump? How do you change a cartridge seal? How, how do you, you know, how do you ohm out a motor? How do I know if the motor is grounded, if it's shorted, if it's got open? Well, how do I know all that stuff? So we're going to be putting some really uh, some pretty good uh, troubleshooting classes together, and so be looking for that on our website. Again, uh, they'll, they'll they'll show up. But again, I'm at 55 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and close this off. Uh, I do appreciate everybody being on and joining me today. I ask that you all be safe, and I look forward to talking to you again very very soon. At this point, this web conference is now ended. Thank you very much.